Hello everyone, welcome to my next video and in this one I'm gonna talk to you about a very important peripheral that can be used in your project when you're moving lots of data or very frequently moving a little bit of data and that peripheral is DMA or direct memory access and it's a peripheral like every other inside a microcontroller with a few exceptions but in the heart of it it has a really simple task move data from one place to another as always, I'll have a few timestamps in the video below if you just wish to see the CubeMX configuration and the example project that I have prepared for you, uh, and in this case two of them. Uh, but if you want to stick around a bit of theory so you know what's going on and how to configure DMA for your project and for your needs, just stick around and we'll go. So the first thing is, when you're going to search a DMA, you're going to find the expression of dual port DMA. And for my uh, microcontroller, which is the 407 VG, and I guess for the 405 family as well, it has two DMAs, so DMA1 and DMA2. And it's called dual port because it has two ports. One is the memory port and one is the peripheral port. These are the two different ports where the DMA takes and gives data. So either from memory, so in this case we look for the DMA1, the memory port is connected to the RAM and to the flash over here. And the peripheral is connected to a little bit of controller over here, which goes into the HB1, where all the peripherals of your microcontroller are. But this is a cool thing, uh, some microcontrollers like this series that have two or maybe even three DMAs, one of the DMAs will have the memory and the port connected to everything. So in this case, you can see that the memory is also directly connected over here to the AHB1 and AHB2. And the peripheral port is not going, well, it also goes to the dual port controller, but it's also directly connected to all the memory peripherals. This means that this DMA can do memory to memory. As you can see, the memory data can flow like this and return back through the peripheral port. So this is really cool because now you can also move the data across the memory. But there's a little bit of rules how you can set it up and we'll see those rules later. If you look the internal diagram of the DMA, this is how it looks. So it has the memory port over here that we saw before and also the peripheral port on the bottom over here. And it has the input and output selectors and internal streams. The stream is like a path for the memory or the data to go in and out of memory and peripheral. And each DMA takes care of eight different streams. So you can have eight different configuration of data flow from either memory to peripheral or peripheral to memory or memory to memory if the DMA allows it. Each of these streams has an intermediate FIFO buffer of size 4 times 32 bit, so 4 words, uh, but this FIFO buffer is not uh, required to use, you can have a straight path down. The main controller is called an arbiter, and this one handles which stream gets transferred data and when. This when uh, argument is required by these stream requests over here, so these are like triggers if you could think of those. I'm gonna have a lot of analogies of DMA and interrupts, because they kind of function the similar but in other ways. You still have a trigger for the arbiter to decide, okay, I'm gonna execute stream 7, let's say. So these triggers, called request streams, come from different selectors over here, so these are selectors that select from 7 channels. So seven different channels, or eight, pardon, eight different channels go into a selection and one of them gets selected and goes into a request stream. And these channels get wired to the peripherals. All these channels are going to the peripherals and some channels on different streams get connected to the same peripheral. This way you can connect your different uh, combinations of your peripheral in your need. I'm going to show you in the table later how that's done. If you're doing memory to memory transfer with the DMA that supports that, uh, this trigger is actually by the software. So this trigger doesn't go to the peripheral, but it goes from the software. Now let's see this table that I have in front of me. So this table is again from the 407, so I might as well know that. So this is for the F407 uh, family. And uh, this is the table for the DMA1. I just cut and pasted the second part that was on the second page. And you can see here on the top you have eight streams from 0 to 7. And on the y-axis you have channels. So these are the, those selection switches, so this. So this is one uh, column over here. 
And as you can see, let's say for the sake of argument, we want to connect our SPI free RX. So when we get data on the receiving uh, register of the SPI free, we want the DMA to trigger. And we also want, let's say green color, want to use the I2C1 peripheral RX. And what we can see that two different channels have selected on the same stream, but we can't have that. Only one channel can go into the stream. So what we can do? Well, maybe we can choose another I2C. Let's see, uh, let's see if there's another one. So there's I2C1 TX. That's no good. There's another oh, oh, I2C2 TX. That's not good. Oh, we have I2C2 RX. So we could use another I2C peripheral, but usually that's not... I mean, it can be a, a problem to do so because maybe you're using a certain peripheral because of pin assignments on your project. Or maybe you're using a lot of pins and you're not free to change peripherals. What can you do? Well, as I mentioned before, some peripherals have also connections to the... Oh, this is not the right color. Some peripherals are connected to different connections on different streams. So as we can see, SPI free RX is connected also on the stream 2 channel 0. And also, I2C1 RX is connected over here on stream 5. So now we can get a combination that we can use both of these uh, requests at the same time. Let's label it in, uh, in red. So we can use this combination. So I2C1 RX over here and stream 2 for the SPI3 RX. We can also use this combination. So SPI free RX on stream zero and the I2C1 RX on stream five. And we can also use this combination. Now you might think, well, if you only have those two peripherals that are work on, working on the DMA, then you're really free to choose any combination. Well, in practice you can, but I also gonna show you why there are some combinations that you wanna consider. So why would you want to choose this one? So the I2C on the left, and the SPI on the right, or SPI on the left and I2C on the right. This is because uh, DMA has built-in priority levels. Well, this is kind of logical if you think about it. It has eight different inputs, and let's say that all of them want to trigger at the same time. So how does it pick? Well, it has a priority scheme. It goes from very high priority to the low priority. But as you can see, there are four priority levels, but you have eight streams. Therefore, some priority, some streams will have the same priority, which is no good again. What if have two streams have the same priority? Well, there's another trick. Much like with the interrupts, they have numbers. So this is the request stream 0, and this is request stream 7. And the lower the number, the higher the priority for the same priority level. So if the both have high priority, and you have, let's say, medium priority, stream 3, and stream 4, Stream 3 will be the first to get served if those interrupts or requests get triggered at the same time because its number is lower. So that's why you might want to consider which combination you want to pick your devices on because if they happen to have the same priority level, then the one with the lower stream number will be triggered first. Now let me show an example. Let's say this is our example. So we have one, two, three, four, five different requests for different peripherals, and they all fire at the same time. How it will happen? Well, first we look for the very high priority. And because it's only one, this is the one that's gonna be served first. Next, let's go to the medium priority. And it's these two. So these two have the same priority level. But because this number is lower than this, the peripheral for stream four will be served first and then the request stream 5. And finally, let's pick this one. It's the low priority for the request stream 7 and 0. Again, because stream 0 has a lower priority number than request stream, this one is going to be served first and then this one. So this would be the worst case scenario order of which the request will get served by the arbiter. Now let's discuss data flow. So one of the data flows that I also discussed with you is a peripheral to memory. So this is where a DMA would go to a peripheral, get some data and put it in memory. Then another is memory to peripheral. Oh, let's give a, a little bit of example over here. So a peripheral to memory would be, let's say, uh, ADC. So when ADC finishes a conversion, you want to copy that value from its data register to your memory location. And this is a peripheral to memory transfer. 
then we have a memory to peripheral transfer and this would be let's say an opposite DAC so you want to have some analog values on your output of your deck so you want to copy those preset values or calculated values from your memory and then we, you would use memory to peripheral transfer into the DAX data register. There is also another mode, let's use this color. It's a memory to memory transfer and this would be just general copying data across the memory and again check your datasheet because in my case for the F407VG it's only DMA2 and it has some limitations or actually some uh, some configurations to do different from these two. Now let's say how uh, does this data actually flow? So let's say we have some kind of scheme, let's say tra uh, traveling data from here to here. So this is the path of data that we're gonna be flowing. And let's say for the hell of it, this is a peripheral and this is memory. So we're doing peripheral to memory transfer. One of the important parameters are pointers to the data we'll have to tell the DMA where the request data is and when is the destination data. So what we can do is we take a pointer, let's say over here. So this is a, a source pointer. So this is where the DMA will grab data from. And then we have to have a destination pointer, let's say over here, over B. So this would be the destination pointer. So the DMA would take data from the location of the source pointer and put it into the destination pointer. So this is how the two parameters you have to know. So in case for the source, for a peripheral, it will have, let's say for the ADC data register, and for the D pointer, you would have, let's say you have a variable, let's say you have uh, unsigned 16 bit value of ADC val, and then you would say uh, that this data pointer is end ADC val. So this would be the pointer or address of this variable. And this is the argument that you put in the DMA. Now that we know where the DMA is going to take the data and when it's going to put it, now we need to tell it what kind of data or how much of data to transfer. So I'm going to call one unit of the memory here, a packet for the ease of expression. And where do we put it over here? So this is one unit and we need to tell it how big this unit is. And we can choose for the width. We can choose from three different widths of 8-bit or 16-bit or 32-bit. Or sometimes this is also called byte, a half word and a word. So these are the expressions that are also used in the data sheet and other literature, so you might as well know them. So this is the width that is specified for both. So this is very important. So the width is the same for the source and the destination. So source and destination. This is very important and this can only be broken this rule if you're using FIFO, which, we, which is what we're going to see later. So this is the width and then we have to tell it how much of data to transfer. So let's say we have a few ver uh, variables that we have to send. Let's say this is uh, our memory. So we're going to have memory to peripheral and this is our uh, SPI. So we want to send a few bytes of data over SPI to a certain device. And in the process, we want to send, let's say, a uh, number of bytes is free which means our width is going to be uh, uh, 8 bit or a uh, byte and our size uh, or data size will be in this case size equals 3 which means that we're going to copy 3 bytes of data and normally let's say we have an array in our memory which means we want to go 3 bytes from this memory into a certain register in the SPI. Now, important for this explanation is also another configuration, which is called the data pointer incrementation. Now, let's pick a red color in this case. So, uh, so we're going to say pointer incrementation. And pointer incrementation basically says that for the amount of data to be sent, in this case, size equals three, are we going to increment pointer after every transfer? 
which will mean if in this case we enable the pointer incrementation after every transfer, let's say the first transfer is over here to B, the second transfer is going to be from here to B, and the third is going to be from here to B, so second and third. In this case, the pointer incrementation for our source was ticked, but the pointer incrementation was not ticked for our source or our destination, which means that we copy data from different parts of the memory conse consecutively into the same part of the memory on the destination. So this is an, a nice example of, in this case, would be memory to SPI or memory to a UART or any kind of protocol where we already have set values that we want to send. And in this case, 8-bit and free words. In this case, pointer incrementation was only enabled for the source and not destination, but maybe you want to enable it for pointer incrementation for destination as well. But this is another uh, expression that you have to know. Another term that you will see and will have to configure with your DMA transfers is the transfer flow. In this case, flow uh, says one thing. Does it do it in one time or it does it all the time? So one time is called normal mode and uh, infinite times is called circular mode. What happens? Let's say we want to transfer three bytes, so size equals three, and we say width equals eight bit. And let's say we want to transfer it from here. So the pointer is showing over here. So E, let's say F is over here. So we will transfer these three bytes somewhere. And let's say we're gonna transfer it to the pointer incrementation. It's gonna be enabled and the pointer incrementation is going to be disabled for here, which means we're going to be sending, let's say, to here. So this is our pointer for the destination data. So all our data is going to go here. In normal mode, when you will trigger a transfer from, uh, from source to destination, this data will go down and a counter will decrease. And when you set the size, it will set a counter. So a counter internal will be of size minus one. And when you will transfer one packet, so here the size is two, when you will transfer one, the size is gonna be one. And when you transfer another, it's gonna decrement and size zero. And when it sees that the internal counter for this stream is zero, it means that the transfer was complete. All of the data or all the amount of data that was configured to be transferred was already transferred. In normal mode, this would be the end of it. But in circular mode, it would reset its pointer. So it would go back over here and then uh, reset the counter configurations to the default value of two in this case and start over at the next configuration trigger. And it would just keep copying data from source to the destination. Another parameter that we saw before was FIFO. So FIFO or first in first out is just a simple buffer. So a buffer that gets filled from one side. So if we have FIFO, here is the input and here is the output. And a FIFO is an asynchronous buffer, which means that the rate of filling the FIFO can be different from the rate of going out from the FIFO. This is really useful if you have, let's say, you're filling in data with a very fast peripheral, but in your microcontroller you don't have the time to take every time one byte or one uh, uh, half word or one word of data into your internal memory, you want to wait until it fills a bit. So that's why you can use FIFOs and it's configurable for each stream separately. Here we have a structure for the FIFO. The FIFO structure is four times uh, a word. So in this case, here's a byte, here's a byte, here's a byte, and here's a byte. So this is one word, so one word, and we have three and four words. So what it does is this uh, allows you different combination of data flow. Before I said that the width is a constant for source and destination. But here, if you enable FIFO, you can mismatch it. Let's say you're receiving data from a device and you're gonna receive four bytes of data. 
so four bytes so the width of source is a byte but for your destination you want to glue those together and send a whole bunch of them you're gonna be having a word so the destination width of the destination equals a word and now the four bytes will come here and then we can transfer the whole lot over here the whole word at the same time so in this case word three and word two word one and word zero and you can also do it for half word and even for half word word and even for half word byte so this is how you can mismatch your input and output or source and destination uh, width so this is really useful because you can take a load of the copying what is the point of copying each byte at a time you're just putting a strain on internal memory structure because each part of the memory structure has its own time dedicated for operating and in this case if we were just told the dma to copy each byte separately that wouldn't be really efficient even though your cpu wouldn't be doing anything but if you really want to be efficient, you can just wait to fill this buffer quarter, half, three quarters or full, and then just copy a whole bunch of them at once and then be silent again until this buffer fills. And you can configure to fill and empty at different rates. So these configurations are when the uh, FIFO triggers. So FIFO triggers can be one quarter, can be one half, or three quarters or full so this is when the FIFO empties so this is that's why these tables have empty one quarter one half three quarters and full noted over here because this is an important parameter when you're setting up FIFO on this table over here you can see different FIFO thresholds in this case so for one quarter one half three quarters and full and for different sizes of byte, half word and word and you can see what different combinations can you do over here because some of the combinations are not allowed of course so this table shows you what kind of combinations you can do and also over here we have the burst mode as well you can also enable burst mode for your FIFO which just means that the FIFO will expect a bunch of data to be ready to be read and it will read it into the FIFO and then just send it all away and it can be in increments of 4, 8 or 16 pieces of data so if we go back we have either 4, 8 or the whole 16 pieces of data another really useful mode for the DMA is called the Dapper Buffer mode and you might have heard of it or at least its kind of use has been really known because when you're having a device that is writing to a particular part of the memory let's say an ADC but then you want to take those data and maybe put it through a filter or send it to a computer you have to know which part of the data is being written to so you don't mess that data up in this case double buffer mode is a dedicated mode of the DMA that you can use to get over that problem let's say we have a memory location 0 and 1 and this is let's say part of the same array let's say we have an array in this array let's say data is of size M and what we can do with double buffer mode we give it two pointers the pointer to the memory location 0 and memory location 1 and let's say the memory location 0 is just data or the, uh, the address of the data 0 and the pointer to location 1 is at a half of it so data M over 2 and let's say that m over 2 equals n just a denotion so this is n amount of data and this is n amount of data so what will happen the first the dma will start copying data over here and go through the whole buffer and will end up over here and then when it's done it's gonna go to its second pointer destination which in this case for our simple explanation is just the same part of the memory just offset by a little factor and it's gonna go over here so to its second pointer location and then it's gonna fill data over here and end up here and then it's gonna finish by going back to this location if circular mode is enabled so only circular or it's gonna uh, end in this case circular mode is enabled in double buffer mode because that's the whole point of the double buffer mode so you cannot uh, change that so why is this good for 
Let's say for the first time, let's say over here, let's put orange. Here the ADC is writing. ADC, right? And you want to take this data and put it through a filter, but you can't because it's being written to right now. And then the ADC starts writing over here. And when this is happening, you can read, modify the, your data. When the ADC is writing over here, or DMA is copying data from ADC over here, you have all this free space over here, so you can work with it. And when the ADC is done over here, you get a signal, oh, I have to move. So when the ADC is then DMA grabbing data from ADC and writing it over here, then we can do it over here right now. So over here, we're reading modify data like so. So this is the use of the double buffer mode because you can avoid reading the data that is currently being written or read. So the DMA is not writing into a piece of data that you're sending to your uh, UART, let's say, and then the data on, over the UART is not going to be valid because it's the one that's being overwritten. So this is the really good use of double buffer mode. Another parameter that I have to mention that is in your data sheet and maybe you will get to work with it is the uh, flow control, so-called. And the flow control basically says the default, the configuration for the DMA, that the size is constant. So if you want to transfer three packets of data, so size equals three, this is it. We have to set this number before we commit the DMA to do a transfer. So this is a required constant. But in rare, rare cases, uh, cases for different devices such as JPEG, so for picture, or eMMC, or other kind of, uh, let's say, SD storage devices, when you don't know how much data will have to be read, these peripherals can actually toggle this size for you. So in this case, the flow control would be external from the peripheral instead of from the user, because you don't know how much data is being prepared by the JPEG. So you just say, okay, size will be set up by this one. And this size will be zero. So zero, remember, transfer complete when it reaches zero. And it will be set by the peripheral when it knows that the DMA has transferred the correct amount of data. So this is just a heads up, but if you will want to use it, you might want to read a few documentations beforehand. Almost the last thing, this is a table that you can also use to your heart so you can easily configure your DMA. This is a table of all the possible DMA configurations. Before we had FIFO configurations, but now we have DMA configurations. So here are all the configurations for different modes, so memory to peripheral, or peripheral to memory, memory to peripheral, and memory to memory. And as you can see, that it's only possible for different memory. As you can see, the flow controller, in this case that I told you before, in this case DMA denotes that you have to manually set the size. So this is for the size. And in this case, peripheral is only available for the uh, transfer modes that also include the peripheral. Can be set by the peripheral, so for JPEG, SD cards, and so forth. And you can see when the circular modes can be enabled. And as you can see, the circular mode, so copying data all over again, isn't allowed for peripheral. And it also isn't allowed for memory to memory transfer. Because if you read the data sheet for the microcontroller, so for this one, this would mean that you would copy one piece of data from RAM to one part of data in the RAM over and over again, circular, and this would just uh, infinitely uh, in the circle. So you would take all the bandwidth of your system. So this is really uh, illogical to use this. So that's why it's forbidden to use the set. And other configurations, so you can look at yourself before you set up your DMA project. And a quick note about the configuration of DMA and why you might want to use FIFO if you have frequent or very large bursts of data is because while well, the DMA is using the same road, as you could call it, of memory connections across the system. And because if the DMA would just be copying data over and over again, other devices like Ethernet, USB and the CPU itself couldn't access the actual memory structure. That's why the whole 
a memory structure is designed in so-called round-robin approach or circular approach, which is the same in, as in sim uh, simple ERTOS uh, operating system. And that is because each peripheral has its own time slice, so-called. So this is its own delta T and it's constant for all of them. Therefore, they each get their own share of time at the appropriate times and this time called the DMA latency or in this case it's the time until the DMA will get its share of the memory it's uh, it's very deterministic because you can uh, determine this uh, data period very uh, finely because this is set in the system so this is configured so if you have really important real-time systems when you want to know when you will have data access this is really good because it's deterministic it's not just whenever and the last table for our theory before we configure our uh, example projects. And this is also an important one because, well, even though we are going to use DMA to avoid interrupts, we also need interrupts. Why? Because we want to know when the data is done copying at the different levels, or maybe you get errors while copying your data. So for that mode, we'll use these two interrupts. So the half transfer complete and the transfer complete. Half transfer complete would be used by, let's say, double buffer mode or in your case of double buffer mode, because double buffer mode can be also implemented manually without the double buffer mode functionality. And uh, in this case, when the half transfer completes means that the first part of your data, so this one, was copied. So you know that you can now start working on this part. And when the transfer complete interrupt will be raised, now you know that you can work on this part of the memory. So this is a really useful part of these interrupts or when you know when you're going to expect new data. But if you get some kind of error, so either transfer error or overrun or underrun of a FIFO. So if the FIFO wasn't uh, emptied before new data was coming into it, this is called an overrun because data was overrunning the previous data. And indirect mode error is again one of the errors that you can check for and I would put those all these errors in the same function and they're again triggered by the same interrupts so they are triggered by the same interrupt but then you're gonna be looking up which of them did occur. Now we're gonna unite with those that uh, skip the theory but this is just to show you what are the functions that are available. So one of the structures that we're going to be using is the DMA handle type def or HDMA something. And this one holds all the configuration for the DMA. So here's the instance. So this is all the actual low level register configurations. So all the configuration that we just talked about. And this is some of the HAL speciality, the lock and the init and its state, of course. And then we have a few functions over here. So these are the callback functions. And these are the callback functions are all the functions that happen at a certain condition. And in this case, this function, these are just pointer to function that will happen on different interrupts. So in this case, you can see this one is for transfer complete. This is for uh, half transfer complete. This is the transfer complete for memory one and half transfer complete for memory one. So this is when you're using double, double buffer mode error abort callback error code for, so you can read what was the error the uh, stream base address so which stream are we using and the stream index so this is the number from 0 to 7. so these are the configuration of the dma and we can look at the functions that are used for the dma so you're going to use the normal start functions as you can see over here and you put with stream so this is this variable over here that you've declared beforehand with all the configurations for the DMA stream and then you're going to put your source address, destination address and the data length. So this is size and this is source and this is the destination address. And you can also start it with the interrupts enabled. So if you want to utilize those interrupts for half transfer, transfer complete and errors, you want to call this function. And again, for uh, double buffer mode, you want to use this from the EX part of the library. So you got to have your source address, also your configuration, source address, destination address, and then destination address too. So those are those two different addresses and your size. So how much of data you want to transfer. And you can also enable it for the interrupts as well. You will also have this function that takes a, a different kind of uh, input. So DMA is change memory. So this is a way for your DMA stream to change which memory. So you put a new address for the memory. So memory is a type def over here. So either memory zero, memory one. So either source or the de destination. So you can uh, change your source or destination memories. 
But this is all too complicated because you have to set up a whole lot of things. One thing, you have to configure all of this, so you have to configure the DMA, and then you also have to configure interrupts, and then you also have to configure, so let's go, just gonna write it, you have to config the DMA, you, if you use the interrupts, you have to use ISR, so interrupts, you have to enable ISR if you're using them, and you also have to enable peri your peripheral. You have to enable certain bits in your peripheral in order to peripheral to send requests to the DMA. And this is a bit too much. So we're gonna go over the hull and the cubemix and how it can do this all for us and the function that ha they have prepared for us to use. But So now you know what the functions that are available and I know that I'm gonna show you functions that you should be using instead of doing everything by hand. But before do doing so, let's go over the example that I have prepared for you. So let's go through a black color, let's say. So in the previous video, if you want to watch it or already did, I showed you how to create a simple period counter. So quickly, let's select our signal. So this is our signal. So this is our signal X and it has a certain frequency and it has a certain period. So this is the period of our unknown signal. So this is TX and it has a duty cycle, DX. And we want to know its uh, frequency and also we tested for period as well. What we did, we utilized a local timer that ran at a certain frequency F0 and we set it up with the appropriate prescaler to 10 MHz, which is the norm. This frequency can be divided by a factor of K. Uh, so we have now a frequency FK, which is F0 divided by factor K or T k equals t0 times the factor k so the period got longer and this is depending on how low the frequency you want to measure and what will happen let's say that this k is 1 and we just get f0 over here we get very fast signal which is our reference f0 signal and what we don't want to do is we want to trigger start our timer over here so this is t equals 0 and then over here for the frequency t equals the amount of pulses, so let's call them Z, times the actual period of our counter, so TK, if you're really uh, uh, actual characteristic. And for this one, it's actually, so the T dot over here, and we call it the Z dot times TK. So this is the useful for the period of our duty, uh, si uh, duty cycle and here for the period of our unknown signal. And we said that the period of our unknown signal is in this case z times tk and our uh, duty cycle so the tx plus so the positive so the positive part of it was uh, z dot times tk but we also got this value from input capture registers so in this case z is the value of the input capture register one and the z dot was input capture channel two so what we can see that the duty cycle was actually the TX plus over the whole TX, which is just the IC2 over IC1. So these are the formulas that we used in the previous video. So now we're up to speed on what the project was. What was the problem? Let's call it in red. Every time we wanted to read this number, so Z or in this case IC1 and IC2 over here. Every time the lower front, so the negative front happened and the positive front. And we called an interrupt every time over here on the edges, so ISR. This means that we call the frequency of ISR was at least the frequency of our signal. But it was probably double because we also used the falling edge. So we trigger two times per period of our signal, which is problematic. If you have 10 kilohertz signal, then you have 10 thousand interrupts a second which is a lot and even more if and 10 kilohertz isn't that fast so you can have lots and lots of interrupts even overlapping each other and your cpu cannot do actual any main task and it's just hanging on doing this kind of stuff just copying data from a lame register into your internal memory what we can do well in the green is a solution instead of calling isr we call the dma over here we call the DMA to copy this data from 
the IC one. So we will have a stream, stream X, and we'll have a stream Y for each of those. So separate stream on a DMA for order. So when this happens, the timer will issue a DMA request. The DMA will come, take the data and put it in a predefined memory location. What it's cool, your CPU doesn't have to do anything. And also the DMA is way faster at copying data. Well, because it's peripheral made for it, but the interrupt is a whole routine. You have to back up CPU registers. You have to initiate a jump. You have to put everything on stack. You have to copy the data and then go back to where you left from. And this whole time you were just copying a piece of data and DMA is a lot faster. Now let's go to the project and show you the modifications. So here is our project from before that was just briefly uh, customized. So if you want to redo this, uh, the clock from my main uh, oscillator is 160 megahertz and going 80 megahertz into the timers. That way, if we go to the timers, timer five is used for the PWM test signal, one kilohertz at 50% duty cycle. So you can test it yourself without any proprietary gear. And timer four was our actual counter. So it was in reset mode and triggered by its first input, which is over here, the PD12. So when the rising edge came, the timer reset and started counting. The channel one started on the rising edge is going to capture the input capture one. And the channel two is indirectly connected. So internally it's connected to the same input and it will uh, trigger on the falling edge. Now in the MVIC, we used to have this global interrupt enable, so we just call the interrupt routine. But right now you can see that I have configured the DMA already. Let's expand this a little bit. So you can see that I have enabled the DMA. We would do this manually by just deleting this one, add, and you'll see all the options for the DMA that are up here. So for the up counter and for the channel one, and you select it. And it already recognized that it the best combination DMA one stream zero. It's a peripheral to memory transfer and its priority can be set over here and let's put medium. The both can be the same because you don't really uh, have a uh, combination when these two trigger at the same time. Also here is the mode. So in our case, we want to have it in circular because we want to just copy it all the time. We just trigger it once and it just starts copying data all the time. We don't care. And over here are the increment addresses. For the peripheral, it's obviously disabled because you want to copy it from the same part of the peripheral, but the memory, we also want to disable it because we want to put it in the same part of the memory all the time. The data width is connected as half word, as you can see, because this timer is only 16 bit, I can only expect a 16 bit number. So half word is suffice. And as you can see, if I want to click byte, it changes both to byte because we're not using FIFO. This means that the both has to match. So we're going to keep it a half word. And this is all. There's also an important because we're doing a really bad example for this and it's really crude, but it works. If we were to leave the interrupts enabled for the DMA, which means that every time one of the DMA transfer happened, then this interrupt would be generated, which would defeat the whole purpose in our project to get rid of the interrupts by default. All the interrupts, if you go to the NVIC, force DMA channel interrupts. This means that all DMA channels will have enabled interrupts. And if I tick that, you can see that the DMA one stream zero and three have enabled interrupts and I cannot disable them. I can change the priority, but I cannot disable them. If you untick this, you can disable them manually. And as you can see, if you go over here, we can see that the interrupts are disabled. And this is very important for this particular project. But for your project, usually you would want this. But if you have really high frequency of data copying, either use FIFO, either use larger buffer and larger transfer size to use interrupts or just don't use the interrupts. And in this case only. So we're going to save this and I'm going to generate the code. But I already have the thing over here connected. So what I'm going to do is just uh, generate this code, compile, upload the code. And we'll see on the watch window what is happening. So I'm going to compile it. Everything's great. I'm going to put the live expression. So this you can see is for the another. So I want to see the IC one or in this case, we don't care about IC one. We want the period 
which is a global variable, the frequency and the duty cycle. And we want to upload them in the bug mode because, oh, we need to configure it. So this one, I'm, I just have the usual ST link, no fancy stuff. We wait for it to connect. As you can see, all the variables has been started. Let's go a little bit here and F8, it started. And I have no interruptions. As you can see, it's working. Period of one millisecond, the frequency of 1000 Hertz and a floating value of duty cycle of 49.9%. So it's a little bit of round of error. So if we remember, this is all the same from the previous project. So if you don't understand it too much, go to the previous video, no problem. But I have created a few functions that I have modified for you for the DMA purpose. So the first one that I want to show you is the FP counter config. So here we had this over here, but now I've added the DMA configurations. So now you want to comment out the FP counter use ISR and just uncomment this one, FP counter use DMA. If you're using low level drivers, you also want to populate these two values over here. So which DMA you're using and which stream for which channel. And that data, as you might have seen before, was available over here. So we know that channel one was on DMA one stream zero and channel two is DMA one stream three. In case you're using low level mode, you have to also populate this, but you don't need to. Over here, I have all the ingredients list of everything you want to do. So even if you're not watching this video, uh, all the steps that you need to do to enable it for the DMA and the uh, uh, interrupt mode is configured over here. And this is all the same as before, but the changes are over here. So you have the static variables for input capture one and two, but the initialization over here is the one that has changed. Here is the IC start for the interrupts mode and the same is for the DMA. It just time IC start DMA instead of IT. And this function, what it will do, it will start our timer. It will enable input capture. It will enable input capture DMA request and it will also automatically enable interrupts for our uh, DMA, but we have disabled them in the cube. So those uh, interrupts are not going to be generated by or not going to be received by the interrupter. As you can see, the parameters the, uh, is the counter. So we only pass the counter in my case is the timer four, which channel the destination, which is the address of the input capture one variable and the amount of data, which is one. And here is the same for the second channel. There's just one thing for me that I don't understand the how this function locks the timer peripheral. So when you want to call this function again for the second channel, it just doesn't execute because the state part of the timer handle is unlocked or busy. So I'm doing a manual uh, a bit of trickery over here. I'm setting it manually to ready in order to execute this function successfully. And I have no problems, but I want to research this more because it's a really weird problem. For those who are using low level, as you can see, there's loads more data to put in when you're using the low level drivers. Here's the configuration for the channel one only and for the channel two. At the end, we're enabling the counter. As you can see, everything is manual. We have to set the data length. So for the which which uh, which DMA. So in this case, this is the FP counter DMA. So DMA one, which channel for the DMA, and then how much data. Then memory address. So in this case is the input capture variable. Peripheral address. In this case is the macro. So timer four control capture compare register one is the uh, the set peripheral address. And the stream is configured for the DMA FP counter channel one. And then we enable the DMA request for the capture compare. So this is what I was talking about before, about having to do a lot of things manually. Here we at least have the low level driver, but you have to enable lots of things manually. And then again for the second channel and then enable counter at the end. Everything else is the same. And as you can see, this project is working. And if I were to change the duty cycle or the frequency of the internal PWM, this was changed over here live. Now let's go to the second example that I have prepared for you, which might have been a little bit more interesting and better shows the use of the DMA. What I wanted to do, and I'm also working on some project right now, 
that I'm using UART. So I'm using UART to send data and receive data from the computer. So I have RX and I have TX. This is UART. And this is going through, uh, um, uh, uh, what is this, the FTDI, FTDI module and to my PC. And I want to receive and transfer data. And what I want to do is receive eight bytes of data. I know in front of head that the protocol is going to be, so protocol is eight bytes per transfer. So in that way and, oh, in this case, in that way and in that way. So what we can do? Well, I can set up the uh, DMA. So the DMA will read from the UART Erix data register. And when this gets filled by one byte, the DMA will trigger and take this data into a variable, which is going to be an array of size eight. And it's going to put it here. And I have a destination. So in this case, it's a destination pointer incrementation. So destination pointer incrementation is checked. So I'm going to put one byte here, one byte here, and then all the way to the byte seven. And then I'm going to finish. I'm going to be completed. And this is going to be in normal mode. So we're not going to do this all the time. Why? Because in normal mode, you just stop when you finish transferring in this case of size uh, equals eight and the width equals uh, a byte. What I want to do is when this is finished over here, I'm going to call an interrupt saying the full transfer has completed. And when I know that the full transfer has been completed, I can move this data to somewhere in a local variable in the main. When I have all the time in the world to look at that data whenever I want, and then I can start again. Because it's in normal mode, you have to start it again. So when the next piece of eight bytes of data will come here, it's going to start filling from the top back to the bottom. And what I can do for transfer is the same. I want to transfer some data, so I'm going to have a TX buffer, which is going to be also the size of 8, and I'll have some data that I'm going to populate it with in my main code. So this is going to be also filled in main. And then I'm going to start DMA to send these bytes into the same register, and I'm also going to have the pointer incrementation over here enabled and here disabled. And then it's going to start filling one by one. So when this one is sent and the transmit register, so this is the UART. When this one is empty, it's going to transfer another one, another, another one. And this is also going to be in normal mode. And when it's done, and when it's done transferring this whole eight bytes, I'm going to say, well, this is a bad color. Let's put orange over here. I'm going to also call an interrupt saying that the TX empty. This way, in my main code, I can uh, search for this variable. And if it's empty, I know, oh, I can pick a new piece of data and put it inside. So this is the philosophy and the idea of this example project. Now here it is, really bare bones. I have configured it for the same frequencies as before. And I only enabled, the, in this case, UART5 peripheral with the RX and TX lines over here. I also have my serial module connected on the PuTTY. And I call already started, so it'll be ready for us. So it's already connected. And if you go to the connectivity and you are at five, here you can see the configuration. I just the normal configuration. So uh, 115,200 bits per second, eight bits, no parity, and one stop bit, receive and transmit. And under DMA, and of course, it's asynchronous UART. Under the DMA settings, we're going to add those. And now we can see that the RX and TRX are available. So we're going to add both. So I'm going to give the medium priority, both of them. And I want, let's say, a higher priority for the RX because I want to really not miss when the data is coming into the uh, device. I want to put it in normal mode and the memory incrementation is enabled. And I'm going to leave it at a byte. I'm not going to use FIFO, but I'm going to leave it at a byte because we're receiving only byte at a time. Now you can add the TX one and it's going to be medium. 
and it's also gonna be a normal mode and byte only. So we can save this. Oh, and let's check the interrupts. And interrupts are already enabled by default for the DMA stream. And this is good because as you as I described before, you, we want in this case our interrupts enabled. But I also enabled for the UART, and I'm only aware for the UART right now, is this specialty for the receive, you, you only need the global interrupts for the DMA. But for transmit complete, you also have to have the UART interrupts enabled. So funny thing. Just keep in mind, if you're doing the same uh, project or same type of project, if you want the transmit uh, transfer complete interrupts to happen, you also have to, for your peripheral at least, you have to enable the interrupts for the whole peripheral as well. Now let's save it, generate our code. So this is going to take us to our main function, and I'm going to show you all the functions. Everything is in main, which is going to be available for you to download. I only declared these variables over here. I'm gonna explain the use of these interrupt uh, functions in a later video, uh, I, it's a really important topic, but let's say there, these are functions that are already declared for us, but they are not defined yet, so they're empty, they're defined as weak, which means we can redefine it once again. And this is really useful because they're already declared somewhere in the HAL code. So the HAL will call these functions and check all the different parameters uh, if you need to call those. So in this case, this is for the UART receive completed callback. So when the UART, whichever UART, completes on receive the whole transfer, this function will be called. That's why we firstly have to check if this function was called, so this interrupt was called for our UART, the one, the one that we care. So if you might use multiple UARTs, you want to do this really, because you can mix them up. Then we say, oh, so the receive, uh, we have received all the data, the uh, receive register is full. So I have a global variable here, rxfull equals one. And the same for transfer complete callback. When a transfer is completed, we want to denote for our UART that the transfer uh, register is empty right now. And then I have the receive buffer and the trans, uh, transmit buffer, and I also have string.h, so I can copy memory much faster. So if we go into our main, I firstly set the rx buffer to full equals zero, so it's not full, so this is a starting condition. And the transmit empty is one. This is really important because your code won't work without this, because it will start and the transmit uh, is not on empty by default. Only then we start it by how you are to receive DMA, which you are where to put the data. So in this case, it's the receive buffer and we want eight bytes of data. And this is all. This is really fine because the HAL does everything for you. And then in our while co uh, code over here, so this is where we have as much time as we need. We're just checking all the time if the RX register is full. Once it's full, we say it's not full anymore because we're copying using memcopy function. So this is from the string.h library, which takes a destination pointer, uh, a, a source pointer, and the amount of data. So in this case, we want to put data from the receive register directly into the transmit buffer and eight bytes of it. And then because this would be boring just sending the same data again back, I'm just doing, I'm incrementing each one of these values by one. So each character, in this case, because we're going to be sending characters, I'm going to increment their value by one. So if I send A, it's going to be B. If I send one, it's going to be two. And I'm doing for that for all except the last one, because the last one will be a special character like return or new line. And then we'll wait because we're in main, we can wait. We'll wait uh, all the time until the transmit empty register, so until the transmit buffer is emptied, which means that the previous transfer is still ongoing. And once the DMA transfers all the bytes from the previous transfer, the callback is going to be called, this variable will be set to 1, and we can proceed. We can call the transmit DMA, which will call for our uh, UART, for our transmit buffer, and 8 bytes of them. So at this point, we're going to test the DMA to send data uh, over the UART, and then we're going to say, well, it's not empty because it's transmitting right now. And then we're going to also enable the receiving part of the UART again for the same Rx buffer and for 8 bytes. So again, uh, so only after here, 
we can get new data in the UR that will be acknowledged. But this is really fine because 1 15,200 hertz versus the 48 megahertz of the CPU is really big difference. So the CPU will catch it with no problem. You would really have to have loaded down CPU in order to miss those moments. Now let's plug this code into the microcontroller. So let's click on the debug. So this is really all of it. So you don't have to write code in any other project. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna enable this and I'm gonna put a few breakpoints. So one is already inside this function and one is already inside this callback function. So we can see when they will happen. So I'm gonna put putty and I'm gonna say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then control enter for the new line. And it just redirected me to this program. So you see that receive call uh, completed callback was called. So the all the data of eight bytes was read and written to the internal register. We can also see over here, we're going to remove this free. Let's remove this free from the previous project. And oh, they're over here as well. And we can see the content of the transmit buffer and let's Rx buff as well. As you can see, these are the numbers that I just tapped in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and carriage return, which means that it's going to return to the left. And then I go forward, so Rx fall gets triggered to one, and then we're going to mem copy all the data from the Rx buffer to the transmit buffer. As you can see, it just changed. And then we're going to execute this code, which is just going to change the first seven bits uh, bytes of this data on the transmit register. So we're going to go over here, control R. And as you can see, now it's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and carriage return. We're going to wait until it's empty. Okay. We're going to transmit this data and going to transmit empty and receive DMA. And you can already see when I ran the code again, it got into the interrupt for the transfer complete. So it already completed the transfer and the transmit empty flag will be set to one and it's already running. And if I keep it from running into the breakpoints and I look into the party, you can see that it rewritten the two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and put the cursor back in the beginning. So if I write A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, it written uh, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, H, because the left one was left uncleared. So if I run again, control R, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, it ran already again. So another control enter, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and it written it. As you can see, if I write really fast, it's just going to overwrite this data and change it a little bit. And you can see in the background, you can see how the data is changing live. So it's really working. So this is a asynchronous synchronous approach to copy data from such bus as UART. Just remember that UART is quite uh, much slower than your CPU, but don't take that liberty too far. So I hope these uh, two examples were really illustrative. So you can use DMA on your own right now for any other project. And I'm going to have all this code, so this main function and the previous uh, project, I'm going to have it available on GitHub as always. If you have some questions, please uh, ask them in the comment section below. I'm currently very busy, so it's been two months since the last uh, postage of my video, but I, I have my master's program right now and I'm working a new job, so it's really stressful and I have very little time to spend, but I'm doing as best as I can to give this video to you so we can continue on more fun projects so we can get the theory out of the way and start building some amazing projects. So thank you again for watching and all the subscription and I'll see you the next time. Bye.